thanks everyone for joining us for the seminar today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Costa Getman, who is Zooming from Penn State University in the United States. Uh, Costa is one of the world's experts on young X-rays from young stars. His research has covered many aspects of star formation uh, using X-rays, including flares, binary interactions, protoplanetary disks, triggered star formation, star clusters, and much more. Uh, Costa obtained his PhD in the late 90s from ICM IRAN in Moscow for numerical simulations of gas dynamical processes in stellar coronae, uh, in solar and stellar coronae. After this, he uh, took a circuitous route leading through Saskatoon, Canada, ultimately ending up in Pennsylvania as a member of the Penn State Chandra ACES team. Costa has been PI of well over a dozen NASA observing programs, including most recently a joint X-ray BLBA study of coronal mass ejection with Jan Fobrich uh, as a COI and a Chandra large program on X-rays from zero age main sequence stars. I know Costa well because he was my PhD advisor at Penn State along with Eric Feigelson. Uh, Costa spent countless hours uh, with me on X-ray projects and I still have many boxes of notes that he wrote, which are now scattered around uh, various parts of the world. <laughs> uh, today, you will hear about some of his latest work about pre-main sequence evolution and X-ray super flares. So, uh, with that, Costa, I leave it to you. Uh, this will be about uh, 45 minutes, and I'll give you about a 10-minute warning. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right. Uh, 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 thank you so much for your warm words and uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for your interest in our research work. Uh, Mike, uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, we can hear you fine. OK, wonderful. So then I will start. So uh, the title of the talk is X-ray flaring and magnetic activity evolution in young suns. My primary collaborators are Eric Feigelson and Gordon Garmeyer. Uh, collaborators on individual projects are Lisa Townsley, Pat Bruce, Michael Kuhn, Thomas Prybish, Vladimir Arapetyan, Agnes Kaspal, Sierk Wanterswiga, Dmitry Semyonov, Nicole Arula Lantham, and Grigory Smirnov Minchukov. Um, okay, and now how I'm supposed to maneuver here? Uh, just, oh, okay, cool. Uh, so the plan of the talk. Uh, uh, the, the content of this talk is based on our uh, five recent uh, ABJ papers for uh, uh, published, and one is hopefully nearing acceptance. Uh, so the plan for uh, of this talk is uh, is follows. So first of all, I will introduce you uh, to some uh, uh, give you some basic information on young stars, magnetic dynamos, uh, uh, magnetic fields, stellar rotation, X-ray activity. And this will be part of motivation for studying X-ray activity evolution and X-ray flare energetics and frequency in young stars. Then I will split the talk into two parts. First part would be related to analysis and results uh, uh, based on time average X-ray luminosity of young stars. And second part would be related to analysis and results of large X-ray flares, uh, followed by summary and list of future related projects. So uh, this is introductory material. Um, as you know, young stars form in molecular clouds and uh, uh, the earlier stages of evolution involve uh, protostars. Protostars are still surrounded by uh, molecular envelopes from the parental molecular clouds. Uh, but later stages when protostars lose their envelopes, they uh, move to T Tauri stars or, or synonym is prima sequence stars. Uh, Titauri stars come in two flavors, disky Titauri stars, so discless Titauri stars. They appear on the Hirschsprung-Russell diagram. They evolve along uh, Hayashi tracks, vertical tracks first, and then switch to Henny tracks. Most of the stars on Hayashi tracks are still fully convective. On Henny tracks, they're already developing radiative cores. Uh, they're contracting, they're powered by gravity. Uh, they're fast rotating. Um, and uh, in uh, this research work, we're interested in T Tauri stars, uh, aka prima sequence stars with ages below 25 million years. So if we uh, look at the uh, prima sequence star of a certain mass, so on Hayashi track, it's, it's larger and it's fully convective. And later on Henny track, it develops radiative core and it's small in size. 
uh, there is a number of uh, papers in the literature, theoretical papers, that suggest that uh, uh, while on uh, Hayashi track and fully convective, uh, the magnetic fields are powered by convection-driven dynamo. Uh, for instance, alpha squared dynamo, where alpha refers to uh, helical motions on con convective flows, and uh, uh, two indicates that those helical motions can amplify and generate both uh, components of magnetic field, uh, poloidal and toroidal. Uh, when they develop radiative cores, for this case, uh, theoreticians suggest that at some point, dynamo may switch to perhaps solar type dynamo, like alpha omega dynamo. In this case, uh, omega uh, term refers to differential rotation and convection zone, and uh, uh, differential rotation uh, for primarily uh, for generates uh, toroidal magnetic fields, and then uh, uh, convective flows in, uh, in the zone uh, generate toroidal magnetic fields, well, poloidal magnetic fields. So at some point of primary sequence evolution, we expect uh, 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 transition of dynamos. With regards to magnetic fields, uh, average surface magnetic fields, uh, I refer to two uh, papers here, Sokol and Kochikov. Uh, Sokol, uh, Sokol's compilation of um, magnetic field measurements, Zeman broadening measurements of average field strengths on very young primary sequence stars with ages less than 5 million years, shown here as average uh, field strengths as a function of effective temperature. So you, you see that uh, typically uh, magnetic fields range, uh, strengths range uh, between 1 and 3 kilogauss. Uh, at a later evolution of stars, like for instance, from 50 million years old to billion years old, uh, magnetic fields uh, decay, uh, as shown uh, in the paper of Kochukov. And, and, and it's shown here, where it's uh, magnetic field strength as a function of age. And this decay is explained uh, by the decreasing uh, filling factor, so uh, the fraction of uh, active regions and photospheric spots uh, decreases on the surface. M meanwhile, uh, uh, important point to emphasize is that the strengths of individual of magnetic fields and individual spots remains constant with age at around few kilogauss. So with regards to rotation, uh, again, I show here two introductory slides. Both slides show on y-axis uh, X-ray luminosity normalized by bolometric luminosity as a function of Rosby number, uh, which is a rotation indicator. Rosby number is a ratio of rotation period to uh, convective uh, turnover time scale. And on these two diagrams, I compare three uh, flavors of stars, main sequence stars, uh, which is shown here as a gray bar. Uh, younger stars with ages less than 5 million, which is shown here as uh, black and red uh, points, and uh, late primary sequence stars with ages 13 mil million years old from uh, paper of Argerofi, which are shown here as gray and black uh, points. And uh, as you can see, main sequence stars, uh, plenty of them are located on this so-called non-saturation locus, uh, where they uh, magnetic fields are powered mainly by uh, uh, alpha omega dynamo. And since dynamo uh, weakens with uh, uh, increasing rotation period and thus with age, we can see the decrease of uh, X-ray activity for these stars. But then also many main sequence stars uh, uh, could have alpha omega dynamo, but very fast rotating and could be uh, located at the saturation locus, as well as uh, uh, low mass M dwarfs, old M dwarfs that are fast rotating and fully convective and powered by uh, uh, convection driven dynamo can also be located here. And so, uh, first thing that you notice that very young stars with ages less than 5 million years, because they're fully convective and powered by convection driven dynamo, they do not uh, locate it on non saturation. They, they cannot be found on non saturation locus. Meanwhile, uh, Argerofi wanted to understand when the uh, uh, dynamo transition takes place in primary sequence stars. And so uh, uh, if they see stars uh, migrating to this non-saturation locus, they would be in one of the observational indications of the transition. And so they indeed found for, uh, for H pair stars with masses above one solar mass that uh, some of them, dozen or so, 
uh, probably transition to non-saturation locus. Uh, another introductory slide is related to how X-rays are generated on stars, in, on pre-sequence stars, as well as on the sun. Uh, of our experience, over 20 years of experience dealing with uh, X-ray activity of pre-sequence stars uh, provided us with information that um, uh, premier sequence stars produce bulk of X-rays similar to that of the sun. Just everything is more powerful and larger. So on the sun, you can imagine this simplistic standard model uh, where we have uh, magnetic loops, of, uh, magnetic flux from the dynamo. It propagates to the surface of the star, typically concentrated in photospheric spots and coronal active regions. And since these magnetic loops, they still, uh, the foot points are anchored at the photospheric level, they constantly move. This um, motions of shearing and twisting of loops uh, produces uh, free magnetic energy. And when loops of opposite polarity interact, they release this magnetic energy through magnetic reconnection. And this energy powers the uh, kinetic energy of electrons in the loop. Uh, electrons spiral down magnetic fields emitting microwave and radio. And then they strike chromosphere and photosphere and uh, this warm footnote parts of the hot footnote parts of the loop emit non-thermal hot x-rays, uh, white light, visible light, uh, near ultraviolet, infrared. And then in the second phase of the flare uh, event, uh, those hot uh, chromospheric electrons uh, photoparate back to the restructured magnetic loop and they emit thermal soft x-rays. So those soft X-rays, that's what we detect with XMM, Chandra, Swift X-ray telescopes. Uh, the new star X-ray telescope is able to detect both uh, non-thermal hard X-rays and soft X-rays. So here I show you a, a typical light curve, X-ray light curve of a premier sequence star. Uh, this is taken from the Chandra Ryan Ultra Deep project data. This is one of the uh, deepest, longest Chandra observation of a nearby a rich cluster, Ryan Nebula cluster. We've uh, written uh, 20 or so papers uh, uh, based on coop data back in uh, uh, early 2000, 2000s. And so what you see from uh, this light curve is uh, there is that uh, quasi-continuous level of X-ray emission, which we call characteristic X-ray level, uh, which we believe is superposition of numerous weak and resolved flares. And on top of it, uh, we see superposition of larger flares. And so uh, the first part of my talk will be devoted to time average X-ray luminosity, which means that we bundle together characteristic and large flares. And the second part of my talk would be uh, focused on these large flares. So uh, one more introductory slide, very important slide. Uh, it, it is related to those cool data that I mentioned uh, on my previous slide. So in 2008, we've analyzed 200 large X-ray flares from premier sequence stars based on the scope data. And we found that uh, premier sequence stars, regardless of the presence of absence of disk, like for instance, this is disk premier sequence star, and this is diskless premier sequence star, they uh, both flavors possess enormous gigantic uh, X-ray coronal star structures uh, 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 that um, reach altitudes of few to several stellar radii. Uh, this is quite different from the contemporary sun. The sun uh, typically has uh, uh, low altitude uh, X-ray coronas and only on uh, occasion, uh, those magnetic loops emitting X-rays can reach heights of half of uh, solar radius. So another introductory slide is related to effects of uh, premissive X-rays on environments, uh, such as X-rays can ionize heat and photoparate gas from disks. And this is uh, one of the major agents along with ultraviolet for disk dissipation around young stars that are located in quiet environments like Taurus star forming region, for instance, with no presence of numerous massive four stars. Uh, X-rays, uh, since they are ionized matter, they can also increase magnetorotational uh, instability, increase turbulence, in increase uh, momentum transport, and uh, uh, they can influence planetary migration. X-rays can also induce ion mole uh, molecular chemistry in the disk. They also can spot the dust grains and thus change uh, grain characteristics. They can influence accretion rates and they can photoevaporate uh, atmospheres of close-in planets. 
So since X-rays are so important for uh, with regards to effects on uh, disks and planets, and uh, since we are so much interested in understanding how uh, Dynamo uh, reacts to the uh, uh, rapidly changing interior of premium sequence stars, uh, it is important uh, for these uh, reasons to study, carefully study uh, evolution of X-ray activity in, in young stars. Previous past works uh, that uh, attempted to study evolution of X-ray activity are listed here. And uh, this is the output from the uh, paper of Pribish and Ferguson 2005. As you can see, they uh, used three primary sequence clusters along with a few ZAMS clusters and uh, field stars, main sequence stars. And they uh, produced this graph of uh, time averaged X-ray luminosity as a function of age. And you can see they uh, saw some uh, uh, indication for decrease of X-ray activity with age. So did uh, the other two papers. Um, but there are drawbacks in these studies related to the fact that uh, these papers used very few uh, number of premier sequence clusters, like three to five per study. And uh, results and, and data were uh, uh, data analysis uh, and science analysis were often heterogeneous. And sometimes they used uh, inaccurate treatment of stellar ages and mass completeness limits. So I will show in the first part of our, our talk um, how we try to improve, mitigate some of these problems, uh, improve and create more accurate diagrams of uh, X-ray activity evolution. And with regards to large flares, large flares uh, also important for understanding uh, magnetic dynamo transition and um, effects on uh, environs. Uh, and with regards to this, it's important to uh, build so-called uh, flare frequency as the function of energy diagrams. And uh, previous attempts were made in, in these papers uh, based on our Chandra and Ultra Deep project data. Like for instance, this is the graph from Alba Chetty Colombo 2007 paper, uh, resulted flare frequency as a function of energy. Uh, which is great. This 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 papers already showed that uh, the flare energy distribution has a slope of two, which is similar to that of solar flares. Which means there are indications that um, of uh, a, some degree of universality of mechanisms uh, X-ray emission uh, on the sun and premier sequence uh, stars. But at the same time, yet again, there were drawbacks in this. Uh, uh, early works related to limited number of uh, powerful uh, X-ray flares used in the analysis. Uh, no mass stratification was applied and uh, sometimes normalization to astrophysical units were not accurate. So yet again, second part of my talk would be devoted to constructing of such uh, diagrams. Uh, just to summarize our science results here, uh, we want to use huge amount of Chandra data uh, for many, many tens of thousands of premier sequence stars that span ages below 25 million years. And we want to obtain this uh, mass dependent evolution of premier sequence X-ray activity, also X-ray rotation relations, uh, flare energy distributions and flare occurrence rates uh, in order to gain better understanding uh, regarding uh, magnetic dynamo transition and the effects of X-rays on disks and planets. So now I'll start the first part of my talk, uh, analysis and results related to time average X-ray luminosity from premier sequence stars. So uh, over the past 20 years, uh, we've observed 42 young star forming regions and 10 open clusters with Chandra. And uh, we were able to characterize over 30,000 premier sequence members of these regions. Uh, these are a few images, uh, Chandra images, uh, for this few star forming regions of individual clusters. Uh, as you can see, we use ACES uh, detector, advanced CCD imaging spectrometer on Chandra. It was uh, designed uh, by Gordon Garmeyer, our boss. And uh, Chandra is very, uh, has a uh, high resolution and sensitivity, and you can see it, it can easily uh, detect uh, individual stellar members of uh, galactic star forming regions. Um, 
so uh, uh, all this data were analyzed, uh, X-ray data were analyzed in uniform fashion, uh, thanks to the uh, employment of our custom tools made at Penn State, SA6 extract tools, X4 tools, and other software. Uh, membership for younger star forming regions that's still embedded in molecular clouds. We used X-rays with the combination with infrared data and uh, uh, applied naive Bayes classifier to identify members. For all the clusters that are already lightly absorbed, open clusters, uh, we used optical data with, with combination with X-ray data. So this is like optical Gaia data. And uh, we identified both X-ray and non-X-ray members. So for non-X-ray members, we estimated the upper limit. And uh, in order to correct X-ray luminosity distributions uh, for upper limits, we applied statistical Kaplan-Meier estimator. And uh, for all these 30,000 stars, we also were able to derive their masses and bolometric luminosities. Typically, we use infrared and optical color magnitude diagrams, such as this shown here, Gaia optical diagram for an open cluster H Perseus. And comparison of uh, these photometric uh, positions of stars on this diagram with the modern parsec prima sequence evolutionary models uh, uh, gave us uh, information on masses and bolometric luminosities. We always construct uh, empirical mass distributions as shown here uh, of X-ray and non-X-ray members of the clusters uh, in order to uh, provide sanity checks that uh, uh, those distributions follow uh, initial mass function shape from Marshburger, such as this one, and uh, also to uh, determine mass completeness limits uh, for each of the observed clusters. Uh, and we also uh, measured rotation periods for about 500 members of uh, open clusters using Zwicky transit facility photometric data. We've constructed autocorrelation functions, uh, lomb skagel periodograms, uh, performed simulations, uh, producing simulated lomb skagel periodograms, compared them with observational ones in order to distinguish between true rotation periods and failure modes, which are often present uh, uh, from ground-based observations. And uh, from folded light curves, we were able to derive sizes of uh, uh, photospheric spots. So this is the first science result, important result. Uh, and the central part of this figure, what is shown is in fact X-ray luminosity as a function of age. Uh, for different mass strata, uh, upper panels present lower masses, uh, lower panels present higher masses. Uh, uh, gray points represent uh, our younger clusters uh, uh, that are parts of star forming regions, and the colored points represent uh, open clusters. So the first result, as you can see, uh, based on these gray points, is that uh, within the first few million years, we found that uh, X-ray luminosity of premium sequence stars is nearly constant, and but. Uh, the stars, premium sequence stars, keep contracting during the evolution. So that means that uh, X-rays do not respond to the uh, contraction of the stars because X-ray uh, coronal extends still very large on these fully convective stars, as I showed you before. Uh, it's uh, consistent with our empirical results from 2008. It's also consistent with the models of fully convective stars, uh, 3D MHD simulations that suggest that such stars produce extremely uh, large uh, uh, spots and uh, coronal regions, active regions, and those spots are able to uh, support gigantic coronal structures, hard structures. But then later during uh, evolution, uh, for late phases, we can see that X-ray uh, become decaying uh, with age moderately. This is for lower mass stars with masses less than one solar mass. Uh, and the slope of this decay is about minus 0 0.6. Uh, this appears to be consistent with the uh, volume, uh, with the rate of volume shrinkage. Uh, and we suspect that uh, convective dynamo, convection dynamo uh, 
is decaying uh, and weakening uh, strongly because of the volume shrinkage. And thus, uh, uh, the magnetic spots become smaller and coronal extents become smaller. For more massive stars at this evolutionary stage, you can see that X-rays uh, drop significantly, much steeper low with a slope of minus 1.8. This appears to be consistent with uh, the decay slope of main sequence stars, such as here, X-ray luminosity is a function of rotation period from Gödel for solar mass stars. And uh, for these older stars, rotation period is a surrogate for age, uh, and the slope is identical. So uh, we suggest that we found another observational evidence for transition, uh, for dynamo transition, where uh, uh, dynamos probably become alpha omega of solar type uh, for these mass ranges and uh, uh, for these age ranges. So which is also consistent uh, with the observational hint from the previous paper of Argerov based, based on uh, rotation period diagram. With, re with regards to Argerofia, uh, again, X-ray luminosity is a function of period. Uh, that hint for, uh, for some of the stars with mass above solar mass being probably already located close to non-saturation non locus, we, we confirm this hint uh, with our independent data. We use deeper X-ray data and we also incorporate chi pair cluster in addition to H pair cluster. And we use ZTF periods different from that of uh, Argerofi. And yes, we can form this knee shaped distribution, X ray luminosity versus rotation distribution. But the result is very tentative. For both cases, result is very tentative um, for a number of reasons, which uh, I'm not going to dwell on it today. More interesting result uh, is obtained when we, instead of rotation period, consider spot areas. Uh, inferred from our rotational analysis. So this is a, a graph of spot areas, a function of age. Uh, we've incorporated not only our ZTF-based spot areas, but also uh, uh, take another 300 stars from the literature uh, with available spot areas. So in total, there are about 800 premium sequence stars uh, shown in, uh, for different clusters. Like there are two clusters bundled here, two clusters here, another two clusters here, another cluster here. Um, and for this uh, wide mass range, we also plot it again, X-ray luminosity as a function of age. Uh, the main result here is the slopes, decay slopes for both X-ray luminosity and spot area are similar. And if, 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 if you remember from my introductory material that uh, magnetic spots, uh, uh, local uh, magnetic strengths in, in spots actually do not depend on age, uh, very strongly and uh, are nearly constant, like at about three kilogauss. Uh, then from these relationships of identical slopes, we can infer the relationship of as X-ray luminosity is proportional to magnetic flux in a power law of one. So what does that mean? Well, it means a big deal because uh, such a relationship, X-ray luminosity is a function of magnetic flux uh, was previously derived for the sun and solar elements and for some old active stars. It was derived actually 20 years ago empirically by Pevtsov. Pevtsov uh, uh, measured uh, magnetic field strengths uh, for different elements on the sun, such as uh, quiet sun, he and brown, uh, bright spots on the sun, micro flares, M-class flares, active regions, uh, average disk emission from the sun. And also all the active stars uh, marked by this uh, magenta locus. And Pevtsov found this uh, universal law, regardless of the size, regardless of evolutionary stage, uh, uh, they seem to be follow the same power law, different magnetic elements. So we've recently uh, considered uh, a dozen of all the stars and Titauri stars taken from uh, uh, recent papers of Koshikov and Sokol, where they have direct measurements of magnetic fields. And we plotted the stars here as X-ray luminosity versus magnetic flux diagram. And we can see that Titauri stars also follow this um, relationship. Uh, this is consistent with our uh, observational finding of for late premium sequence stars, Titauri stars to presumably also follow this relationship. 
So, but there is more interesting result follows. As I told you before, we're interested to understand when dynamo switch takes place on premier sequence stars. And for that, uh, we can look at the theory of uh, convection driven dynamo, specifically this work here, Christensen 2009. This is a uh, work was published in Nature. Um, and what uh, these brilliant researchers found is with regards to convection driven dynamo, they found another universal law that uh, uh, considers planets, Titauri stars, and old M dwarfs uh, that all powered, they all fully convective and powered by convection driven dynamo. And they found universal law that convective flows, kinetic energy of convective flows can set uh, the strength of surface magnetic field on, on these objects. So from this, uh, from their works, we, we take this uh, analytical um, formula for convection dynamo, uh, where the uh, right term expresses kinetic energy of convective flows in terms of mass, bolometric luminosity, and radius. And we apply this formula to samples of our premier sequence stars uh, to estimate magnetic fluxes, such as this panel here shows light green uh, uh, our subsample of fully convective premier sequence stars from nearby star forming regions like Orion Nebula cluster, IC348, and NGC 2264. Uh, the reason we take uh, very nearby regions because uh, Chandra sensitivity for them is very deep down to 0 0.2 solar mass. But really what you see, if we plug this, uh, uh, if we take this formula, then uh, premier sequence stars indeed follow more or less this universal law as we expect. And that distribution also consistent with the distribution of these uh, dark green points, uh, which are direct measurement, uh, which are Titauri stars with direct measurements of magnetic fields. So, Overall, everything is consistent. That's what we expect. We expect that premier sequence stars should follow uh, uh, this universal law. And because these premier sequence stars are fully convective, this formula should be applicable in, in their cases. But then we will go uh, to subsamples of uh, our stars that are located on early Henny tracks and on late Henny tracks. And what we found that application of uh, the same formula is still applicable in the case of early Henny stars, but totally breaks in, in the case of late Henny stars, uh, or, which suggests that uh, this is the stage, typical stage where stars probably at their magnetic dynamo undergo uh, changes from uh, uh, convection driven to perhaps solar type dynamo, late Henny tracks. So, that's all with regards to my first part of the talk related to uh, averaged X-ray luminosities, time averaged X-ray luminosities. Now I switch to the second part of my talk, um, uh, which is- I just wanted to cut it 10 minutes. 10 minutes, thank you. So with regards to large flares, uh, so far we've uh, able to analyze um, very young premier sequence stars with ages less than 5 million years. We use the Chandra data and feed them with Poisson regression model. And that this uh, uh, helped us to identify over thousand large flares. Examples are shown here, like constant uh, case, mind variable, but this is large flare and it's fully captured by the Chandra observation. This is rise phase of a large flare, uh, partially captured by Chandra observation, and this is uh, partially captured decay phase of large flare. So we've converted count rates to X-ray luminosities and estimated energies of these events. Since uh, uh, there are many cases of uh, partially captured flares. We again used kaplan mayer estimator to correct uh, energy distribution for the presence of uh, lower energy limits. Uh, we also performed sophisticated uh, flare modeling for a number of bright stars. Such modeling allows us to actually estimate geometries of flaring loops, such as thickness and heights. But the most important point related to this talk is this inferred diagram of flare frequency as a function of energy. So our large X-ray flares from premier sequence stars are shown here in the right uh, upper corner, color coded by mass. Uh, the magenta is one solar mass, light green is 
uh, lower mustache and uh, dark green uh, uh, high mustache. And for comparison, we show this uh, brown curves here from uh, Okamoto 2021. Uh, this is uh, a uh, Kepler flare analysis of optical flares from numerous old G type stars like Sun. Uh, this curve, point curve, is more accurate and more recent than the solid curve. So we'll be concentrating on this, this curve here. Um, and so with regards to the Sun, the most powerful flare so far detected from the sun uh, by modern astronomy was a Carrington event that took place in 1859. And uh, Carrington event was observed by uh, Richard Carrington uh, as an uh, optical flare. And then 18 hours later, coronal mass ejection associated with this flare, it's a bundle of charged particles and magnetic fields arrived uh, to Earth, and they interacted with magnetosphere and with ionosphere and created geomagnetic storm that uh, melted telegraph across uh, uh, Europe and North America. So this is so far by far the largest flare that uh, modern astronomers experienced. And this Carrington event has an energy approximately between 32 and 33 arc in log. And so if you consider this, the frequency of such flares on Sun, would be about one in 500 years or so. But then uh, let's talk uh, about more powerful flares, 10 to the 34 flares, we call them super flares. On, on the sun and all the solar type stars, such flares, if they if present, if they exist at all, uh, their frequency would be once in 100,000 and over 100,000 years. On premium sequence stars, such flares uh, appear over 200 flares per year. And uh, more powerful flares that generated by uh, main se polymer sequence stars, the uh, uh, current sun would never be able to generate such flares, such as powerful super flares and mega flares. We, we, we classify flares as mega flares if they have energies above 10 to 36. Um, so with regards to mega flares specifically, we estimated their contribution as approximately 10, 20% to the total um, uh, X-ray energy energetics of premium sequence stars and premium sequence stars produce about three mega flares per year. So uh, this slide with regards to uh, evaporation of planetary atmospheres, I I, I wanted to use this uh, mini uh, Neptune planet HD 6343C um, uh, because its surface uh, gravity is uh, comparable to uh, our planet Earth planet. And it uh, orbits around Zams solar mass star, Zams star. And if, if we consider its mass loss rate from Lyman alpha observations, and also consider uh, theoretical estimations of hydrogen capture by a uh, protoplanet like uh, mass, S mass core, which uh, orbits around solar mass premium sequence star, then we can scale those numbers and estimate that uh, young protoplanet, S like protoplanet, will lose its uh, hydrogen envelope, hydrogen atmosphere within 2 million years if uh, uh, such star uh, lost its disk very early uh, uh, in evolution. And that can happen, statistically speaking, 20% of stars lose their disks very rapidly uh, within the first 1 million years. But mega flares can contribute probably significantly to, to this uh, uh, evaporation of protoplanets because uh, mega flares are highly nonlinear events, and uh, uh, this non-linearity, uh, meaning huge amount of energy just dumped within one day, uh, uh, can force planets to uh, release much more hydrogen. This is an example for old planet, uh, observed planet, which known to uh, exhibit uh, variable escape rates. And uh, of it orbits old K-type star. And when a, a X-ray flare by Swift X-ray telescope was detected on this star, a few hours later, HST detected a huge uh, escape of uh, planetary atmosphere, suggesting that flares are really crucial with regards to this issue. And the modeling of uh, this case was done recently by Hazra 22. And they suggest that it's not only flares that contribute to planetary escape, but coronal mass ejections that often accompany uh, flares. Unfortunately, in case of premium sequence stars, 
coronal mass ejections have not been detected yet. And so uh, this uh, uh, plans for our future actions with regards to detecting coronal mass ejections. So my last slide is related to uh, mega flare house power. Uh, this uh, unique binaries, high eccentricity binaries, such as DQ Tau. Uh, DQ Tau has two young stars, Loma stars, that uh, um, uh, in a binary system with uh, high eccentricity of 0 0.6. So during separation, uh, during periastron, uh, such systems separated by only eight tenths telaradi. And uh, we've uh, observed DQ Tau um, uh, often using. Uh, uh, millimeter band observations. My uh, colleague uh, Demarissa Salter observed several uh, large millimeter flares every time she looked at the periastrum passage of this system. And uh, I looked at three periastrum passages uh, using different X ray telescopes. And every time we look, we, we see a set of uh, super flares, X ray super flares like this one here. And the total energy of these super flares classified them to be a mega flare. And so every 16 days, such a system produces mega flare. And the reason it's magnetically capable of doing so is because uh, its uh, magnetospheres collide. Every time uh, uh, components uh, get closer to each other, magnetospheres shrink, accumulate free magnetic energy, and then they re release it as a flare events. And uh, energetics of these events, uh, observational events, is consistent with the uh, predicted energy from colliding magnetosphere model of Adams 2011. So this is about its summary. So we've collected huge amount of Chandra data uh, uh, and complemented infrared and optical data. Uh, and uh, we've accumulated data for over 30,000 premier sequence stars. And we were able to um, construct the X-ray activity uh, evolution diagrams and um, uh, find solid observational evidence for dynamo transition, evidence for that supports universality of X-ray magnetic flux law. And we also detected over thousand large X-ray flares from premium sequence stars that have energy slope consistent with that of solar flares, but uh, uh, have uh, flare frequency and energetics million times higher than that of on, on, on the sun. And the mega flares specifically can contribute likely significantly to the uh, planetary atmosphere erosions. And DQ Tau uh, is a high eccentricity binary that is a definitely a mega flare powerhouse. So this are our future works. Uh, Mike, how, how much time I, I, I have? Uh, th th these are our future yeah. works. Um, uh, there are five projects we're currently running uh, related to the same issues. Project number one, we um, currently, Chanda is observing more older clusters with ages uh, below 30 uh, uh, million years in order to keep investigating how X-ray activity changes for older open clusters. We also uh, want to extend our studies of uh, flare energy distribution and frequency for all the premium sequence stars. We already have data for open clusters. Uh, we're also interested and currently in initiated project of uh, searching for hyperflares, it's flares with energies above 10 to the 38, 10 to the 39, perhaps 10 to the 40, uh, to test magnetic capabilities, limitations of premium sequence stars. So far, empirically, we were able to detect only flares with energies below 10 to the 38. But uh, tarantula nebula star forming complex located in large Magellanic clouds, and uh, uh, which was uh, observed by Chandra for two megaseconds, uh, Lisa Townsley PI, uh, has intrinsic population of stars that exceeds significantly the intrinsic population of all galactic star forming regions and open clusters that we studied so far. So tarantula nebula observations, they offer this opportunity for us to, uh, to search for hyperflares. Uh, we're also involved in another project. Uh, Chandra will be, uh, uh, Chandra will start observations in December. Uh, this is multi-observation uh, projects with HHT, VLBA, ALMA uh, to, to detect mega flares, catch mega flares with Chandra, to measure magnetic uh, fields after mega flares with HHT, to search for coronal mass ejections with VLBA, and to search for the indications of discanization with ALMA. 
uh, VLBA is uh, the lead of VLBA observations is Jan Forbrick, uh, 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 the member of your group. And um, finally, we also uh, uh, taking this XUV input from our empirical data and providing this input to our th uh, theoretical uh, uh, collaborator, Vladimir Arapetian, who runs um, uh, various models, XUV and CME, uh, modeling of effects on disks and planets. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you so much, Kosa. I'm going to turn the uh, computer so that you can see the audience. And now we've got some time for, for questions. So if you're online and have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, if you're in here, uh, raise your hand too, and then come up so that uh, you can be heard over Zoom. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, Jan, go ahead. Hi, Costa. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, there's a lot in there, and uh, and it is actually good to, that, that we have some more time for discussion later on. I was wondering, in in the large sample of of stars that you've now assembled, what's what's the lowest mass that you have? Uh, a good sample size and good constraints on, and and uh, do you see deviations for the for the lowest mass objects that that uh, that are accessible in this way compared to, for example, solar type uh, stars? Thank you, Jan. Uh, good question. Um, uh, let's go down, down, down. So, uh, uh, go. Down, a little bit down, down. Here, uh, oopsie. Here, here, here. Why are you jumping so much? Okay. So for open clusters, um, our completeness limits were down to 0 0.75 solar mass. And this is in comparing both X-ray detection and X-ray non-detection. For, uh, for these clusters, for younger clusters, uh, we we could go to 0 0.75. Uh, of course, we've even comparated like hundreds uh, of clusters for uh, that are members of 42 star forming regions, but some of them were less complete, some of them were more complete. For these specific diagrams, so that uh, would be uniformly constructed down to 0 0.75 solar mass, we only chose clusters that are complete down to 0 0.75 solar mass. Uh, however, for some diagrams, like this diagram here, uh, some of the uh, very young clusters are complete down to 0 0.2 solar mass. That was Orion Nebula cluster, IC348, and GC 2264, nearby star forming regions. So for that purpose, uh, I, I, I plotted just those stars down to 0 0.2. Whereas these ones, uh, open cluster members are still complete down to 0 0.75 here. So with regards to, is it different? Uh, do we have uh, differences uh, uh, compared to the sun? Uh, well, you, you already can see here. So there is slight difference here in the sense that uh, lower mass stars uh, have a little bit steeper um, LX versus magnetic flux relationship mm -hmm. than uh, um, more massive Titauri stars. And, um, um, and uh, such most deeper relationships are all actually also predicted. Like for instance, this dashed line is from Kirichenko, which they considered only flares, like solar M class flare here and solar micro flares, and and they uh, and they uh, estimated the steeper slope here, as well as uh, theoretical works by Juleko, for instance, um, who uh, postulate that very active stars, very active uh, stars. Uh, may produce extremely higher magnetic field strengths uh, on their surfaces, uh, which would lead to, to steeper slopes. And in fact, we do see some indications of this based on our modeling, which I didn't show you because I didn't have time of our modeling of uh, super and mega flares, bright super and mega flares that tend to move to 
to kind of to this uh, to this uh, uh, lines of with a steeper slope, and thus that's why you and I and other collaborators initiated these projects, uh, estimating magnetic fields for such cases of mega flares to see if we detect uh, abnormally large uh, magnetic fields in spots. Not three kilogauss, let's, let, let, as typically detected in on the sun or premium sequence stars, hopefully in spots, but uh, five, 10, 20 kilogauss. Juleko suggests the magnetic fields up to 20 kilogauss strengths. So perhaps this lower mass stars, the uh, X ray more active, and I need to think about it more uh, in order to answer this question. But that could be related to the fact that perhaps uh, flare wise, they're more kind of active um uh, but uh, that's that's all i can tell you right now <laughs> thanks yeah uh nicola go ahead yeah mm, i was wondering so on one of your slides you showed um sort of mag uh, cartoons of magnetospheres cross sections of magnetospheres of this object and it looks like the flaring loops in these cartoons are much bigger than stars themselves which is well of course um, different from um, solar flares, where typical sizes of um, flaring volumes are about like few percent, ten percent of the solar radius. So I would expect that the typical time duration of this events um, should be much longer, because obviously, from MHD point of view, it should be proportional to the squared size of the of the of the flare in the loop so yeah. i would expect that the duration of this events should be like tens of hours probably is it what you see yes uh that's correct uh yes your observation is correct yes that was the slide that uh, we inferred that uh, uh coronal structures emitting coronal structures on premium sequence stars can reach altitudes of few to several stellar radii compared with the sun that typically like you said they have close to the surface on occasion Yoko saw this long duration event here on occasion we might see uh, long duration events on the sun uh, that associated with uh, loops reaching up to half the solar radius so yes um, the graph would be the, for instance taking from uh, 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 this paper here and I've compared I've, I've created many of such graphs where we compare properties of uh, large x-ray flares and solar flares uh, like this one for instance do, do you see this those figures do you see those yeah. Yep. yeah uh, um, for instance here you can see loop scales uh, the ones that were detected on premium sequence stars as a function of uh, uh, peak temperature in the flare so this um, uh, blue locus is a locus of solar flares and locus of uh, flares from active stars from Gödel work and from uh, um, famous uh, Ashwanden work. Uh, and, 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 and this is uh, sizes of associated with flares from premium sequence stars, those red ones and black ones. So the sizes yeah. Ah. Okay. You you asking you asking about duration. Duration is right here. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm mainly interested in duration. Yes. So th that's duration. This is the locus of solar flares, which can uh, go from uh, uh, seconds to maybe thousand seconds to sometimes for long duration events like uh, the one associated with Yoko event. The duration was indeed su super long, uh, a day or so. And yes, durations of this uh, large premium sequence flares uh, shown in red and black. Uh, typically uh, 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 reach uh, 50 kiloseconds uh, a day, half a day, a day. Sometimes we even uh, 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 observe uh, flares from premium sequence stars that last few days. Uh, yeah, you're correct. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, we're about at time. Uh, but I guess two things that I want to say. Uh, one is that uh, COSA had, uh, is going to be visiting with us for the uh, star formation and low mass stars meeting that we have on Friday. Uh, that's 2 p.m. in the SEPnet room. And uh, uh, 
Hari is going to send out an email with some information about uh, the event and also uh, the Zoom link for anybody who wants to uh, participate remotely. And then the other is, uh, Costa, do you have any more time? Often we have some time for students to chat with the speaker after the talk. Yeah, I, I can chat right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And let's give Costa another kind of applause.